Hi, this is John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV. We have another presentation on Super Sunday with Vinod Felix. Um, he's going to tell about his topic, but let's first meet the panelists before we turn it over to Vinod. Manuel, could you introduce yourself again? Hello, Manuel. Uh, I'm Manuel. I'm, I'm Manuel. I'm from Mexico. Uh, uh, nice to see you. From Mexico Hi. City. I just met him. Last, I just saw him two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, Sunil, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Sunil, and I'm right now in China. And I'm a resident. Yeah. I'm doing residency in China here. Very good. Welcome, Thank Sunil. You. And Dr. Kubulo. Let me unmute you there. Maybe he may have stepped away. Okay, Jason, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Jason Evans. Nice to meet everyone. I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. My background's in healthcare and artificial intelligence and extended reality. Okay, he's going to give a talk in the next hour. Okay, very good. Okay, Vinod, thank you very much for coming and welcome. It's all yours. So, hello to everybody. I think I am going to talk on something which the which many neurosurgeons and many e-decisions don't do routinely while they do endoscopic surgeries. So this is the endoscopic approach to the cavernous sinus. Vuna, could you just say where you're from and uh, where you're practicing, etc.? cetera? Uh, definitely. We take oh, my... oh, okay. That's part of your presentation. Okay. I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. So um, I am from Kerala. Kerala is the southernmost part of India. Uh, Kerala is one of the most beautiful places, probably in the entire uh, world, maybe. It's almost like Nepal. It's very green. We have a lot of backwaters, and um, the people are also very nice here. Uh, I actually would really invite you all to come to Kerala sometime and what do you call it, enjoy my hometown. I think, John, you have, you have never been to Kerala. I think. I think you must consider coming to Kerala sometime very soon. Okay. And so I work in a couple of hospitals which are listed down here. I basically am a ED surgeon. I collaborate with many neurosurgeons to do the endoscopic skull-based surgeries. For example, I have a very good collaborator, Dr. Ajit, uh, at SUT Hospital, and most of these cases were done with him. And at times, I find pleasure to would even go to Nepal and do a lot of good cases with Dr. Aicharya. Uh, so that's about me. And so coming to the topic, I'll be talking on endoscopic endonasal surgery to the cavernous sinus. So the parasolar extension or the extension to the cavernous sinus used to be a limiting factor. That is an area where probably nobody is come, nobody was comfortable with operating, uh, whether it's an open approach or maybe an endoscopic but People are not comfortable in operating the cavernous sinus. And it used to be no man's land until probably Winko Dolan's and Parkinson's ventured into these regions. And the what you call the basic trick in operating this region depends on how you understand the anatomy of this region. So all these basic stuff like the dural virus sinus, it is sort of caverns, that's it's called the cavernous sinus, the true cavernous membrane. Maybe these are beyond the limits of this talk. And you know that it has four walls. It is board shape. It has a roof, lateral wall, middle wall, and a posterior wall. The approach in the pre-endoscopic era was mainly from the lateral wall and the roof. And hence, the anatomy of cavernous sinus was always described from that perspective, from lateral to middle or from inferior, or from a superior to inferior perspective. So this is the roof of the cavernous sinus. You all know that probably. This is actually the 
the lateral view of the cavernous sinus, you are seeing the carotid artery, this is the horizontal petrous carotid artery, this is the Meckel's cave, and <coughs> this actually is the pinnaudal triangle, the oculomotor triangle, the supratrochlear, intratrochlear triangles of cavernous sinus. And coming to the spaces within the cavernous sinus, Harris and Rotone described three venous spaces in relation to the intracavernous carotid artery. So the first is the, what is the medial venous space? That is the space between the medial wall of cavernous sinus and the carotid artery. It's a medial venous space. And the second space above the horizontal uh, carotid artery is the superior, post so superior space and below the carotid artery, the antero inferior space. This is the antero inferior space. So, post so superior, antero inferior, and medial venous space. So, three spaces were described by Harris and Roton. But these spaces are really not of that much use when you do the surgery in an endoscopic uh, manner. Because in the endoscopic approach, we are going to approach the cavernous sinus from an entirely different trajectory. We are going to come from anterior to posterior and from medial to lateral. So our anatomy is going to change uh, or, or, or the way we view things are going to change slightly in a different manner. Maybe you can see this diagram. So the reality at times is so complex that the equally valid observations look entirely different from a different perspective. So we need to relearn the anatomy from a different perspective. And that is why uh, we have this pioneering work by Joan Fernandez, Paul Garner, Carl Snellman, and the group from Pittsburgh. They proposed a surgically relevant classification of the, from the endoscopic perspective. And this classification is based on the uh, position of the cavernous spaces in relation to the intracavernous internal carotid artery. It is more or less similar to the rotund space, but maybe slightly different. And this is their paper. Uh, are you getting this image there? So this actually is the interior, the view of the uh, carotid artery after removing uh, the bone of the spinoid sinus. And between these two yellow lines, this is the cavernous carotid artery. So this here is the paraclival carotid artery, and from here to here is the cavernous carotid artery. This is the paraclinoidal carotid artery, and this is the optic strut or the LOCR, lateral optico carotid recess. So this cavernous internal carotid artery can be further subclassified or divided into. A short vertical segment. This is a short vertical segment. This is the posterior genu. This is the horizontal segment. And here we have the anterior genu. So anterior genu, horizontal segment, posterior genu, and the short vertical segment. <coughs> this again is the left side internal carotid artery, left side cavernous sinus viewed from the medial to lateral perspective. So this is the left internal carotid artery. The medial wall of the cavernous sinus, the dura of the medial wall of cavernous sinus has been removed. And this here is a short vertical segment. This is the posterior genu. This is the horizontal segment. And this is the anterior genu. And lateral to this carotid, you have the lateral compartment. Actually, if you take the rotons classification, the roton described with three spaces, medial, medial, post superior and antero inferior. Whereas in endoscopic classification, we don't have a medial space, but we have a lateral space. Whereas in, in the rotons classification, we don't have a lateral space, but we, we have a medial space. That is because when you come from medial to lateral, you don't find a medial space, whereas when you come to the other side, you find a medial space. 
that is basically because of the difference in the way you approach this compartment so and in the endoscopic classification the posterior superior compartment of the rotunds has been further subclassified into superior compartment and a posterior compartment and the inferior compartment is the same as the previous rotunds thing and we have a lateral compartment so as per roton the there is basically no space between the lateral aspect of internal carotid artery and the lateral wall of cavernous sinus because the six nerve is the six nerve the medial aspect of six nerve touches the internal carotid artery on one side and the lateral wall of cavernous sinus other side but basically what happens when there is a tumor is that this space that the space this lateral space which is occupied by the six nerve gets expanded and so a, what you call a potential space is created there that is why we have a lateral space when there is a pathology so coming again to the compartments this is the posterior compartment this is a superior compartment inferior compartment and lateral to carotid we have the lateral compartment and basically the most important thing in this presentation this is my carry home message the most of the pituitary tumors hello hello is there somebody asking a question to me no i don't know who that is um everybody's muted oh i'm sorry i'm sorry there's one person i didn't mute go ahead i'm sorry we're done okay so the what you call the most important thing which i want to convey in this presentation is most of the pituitary tumors actually spread from the cellar space to the superior compartment that is exactly above the horizontal cavernous carotid artery and so again to orient you this is the roof of the cavernous sinus this is the posterior wall of cavernous sinus the medial wall of cavernous sinus in the pictures has been removed to so the interior interior of the cavernous sinus so the most of the tumor spread to the superior compartment and in this superior compartment you don't have any cranial nerves this is a very safe space to operate you just need to follow the pathology from the cella to the superior compartment and as long as this dura this roof of the cavernous sinus is intact you are not going to damage the third, third nerve in the cavernous sinus because the third nerve here lies lateral to the roof and so this is a very safe space to operate and fortunately this is the most common space affected by the pituitary tumor and what happens here is in the roof the third nerve lies lateral to the roof here it lies lateral to the roof between the two layers of the dura of the lateral wall so it lies in the interdural space lateral to the roof and so this is the oculomotor triangle here this is the oculomotor triangle so anterior this is the clinoidal triangle and you have the interclinoidal ligament here so just in front of the just at this region the third nerve enters into the lateral compartment of the cavernous sinus which basically lies lateral to the anterior genu of the carotid artery so that is about the superior compartment and when you come to the posterior compartment you have the uh, petroclival dura which, which forms the posterior aspect of the posterior compartment anteriorly you have the short vertical segment and down below you have the gulfar segment of the cis cranial nerve so this compartment uh, one other content is the meningeal hypophyseal trunk so when you operate on this compartment you can at times risk the cis cranial nerve especially if you get a bleeder from this place which is the which is called the venous confluence of the venous gulf where the superior petrosal the inferior petrosal the cavernous and the basal are all these venous spaces joined so if you get a bleeder from this place it's really difficult to control and if you overpack that region you can get a six nerve palsy and at times you will have to control the inferior hypophyseal artery also these are the important things in this compartment the superior and posterior compartment can be exposed in the same manner as you do the pituitary uh, surgery so same transcellular exposure is adequate to do the these two spaces whereas if you need to remove a tumor from the inferior or from the lateral space you need to do the transterigoid approach which is an extended approach 
So these are some scans showing the tumor in the superior compartment, the posterior compartment, the inferior compartment. This is actually the lateral compartment, the compartment which lies lateral to the carotid artery. And uh, the lateral compartment is the most, what do you call it, most difficult and the most riskiest place and probably still the no man's land for many because if you are not careful here, you can injure the three, four, six cranial nerve. So this space is really challenging to operate upon. But fortunately, most pituitary adenomas don't extend to the lateral compartment. So uh, again, to uh, uh, what you call it, again to put in a nutshell, the superior compartment, the third nerve is lateral to the dura. You can access this space with a uh, conventional transpinoidal endoscopic approach. The posterior compartment has a six nerve, so oversteal stacking can cause, cause a six nerve palsy. Superior and posterior can be done in the same routine transpinoidal approach. The inferior compartment has the six nerve and the sympathetic trunk. The lateral has the three, four, six, and V1, and the intralateral trunk. So lateral is the most difficult space to operate. So now let us see some surgical cases. This actually is a 45-year-old female with the left three, four, six cranial palsy. You are seeing the scans there. And so the superior compartment and the posterior compartment is affected. Now we are going to do this with the endoscopic approach. You are seeing the video now. We opened the cella. I removed the tumor from the inferior or the cellar part of the tumor has been removed now. And now I am working in the left paracellar region. This is a supracellar tumor. So left paracellar region is here. This actually is a short vertical segment, short vertical, and this is the horizontal segment of the cavernous carotid artery. Here you are seeing the roof of the cavernous sinus. The roof of cavernous sinus is a horizontal segment, it's a short vertical segment. So it is really not that difficult to remove tumor from this superior compartment, the superior compartment and this posterior compartment has been removed in the tumor. That is actually a oculomotor triangle here and this is the clinoidal ligament. It's a clinoidal ligament. It's the inner clinoidal ligament and lateral to that you have the lateral and anterior you have the third one. So the tumor has been completely removed from these two spaces. And after the paracellar tumor removal, you come to the supracellar part. You remove the supracellar tumor and you are seeing the arachnoid herniating down. That's a diaphragma cell herniating down. And a bit more tumor removal. And here we don't have a CSF leak, so you just need to put the nasoceptor flap or the Haddad flap to cover that region. There is no need of plugging with that also. So that was actually a case of superior and posterior compartment tumor removal. So this actually is an, next case is an ACTH secreting microadenoma of the left cavernous sinus. This also improved, involved a superior compartment. So it's the same thing. That is a short vertical segment. This is a horizontal segment. And this is a microadenoma removed from the superior compartment. And now let us see uh, the lateral compartment dissection. The lateral compartment, as I told, is really challenging. But uh, here we had a meningioma. Uh, there is a huge meningioma here, the petrous apex involving the cavernous sinus. And that was removed by the neurosurgeon with the half and a half approach. And the patient actually presented with three, four, six cranial palsies. And after the removal, we see that there is some residual tumor in the cavernous sinus and cellar region. And the cranial palsies also persisted. So this is the post-op scan after the external approach. And you are seeing the tumor in the cavernous sinus and the cellar region. 
and the patient also has a cranial palsy. And that was why we thought that we'd go ahead and we'll decompose the tumor from the cavernous sinus, giving a possibility for the cranials to, uh, what do you call it, recover. In fact, we waited for one month for the recovery after the open of the but there was no improvement. And that is when we planned for an endoscopic approach. So, that, this is the surgery for the same patient. So the tumor is in the left cavernous sinus. We are taking the Haddad flap from the right side. There is a Haddad flap. It's being parked in the coina. This again was done with Dr. Ajit, our neurosurgeon. And now it's the left side. We are removing all the ethmoids. And as I told you, to, to get into the lateral compartment, we need to do the trans approach. We need an extended corridor. So for that, we are removing the, this is a maxillary wall. We are exposed, we are removing the maxillary wall, anterior and middle maxillary wall. This is a maxillary sinus, posterior wall. So we are taking the cavity of nasal cavity plus the maxillary sinus to work into the lateral aspect. <coughs> so this is the posterior of maxillary sinus. So we locate the spinopalin artery. That is the spinopalin artery. And it is cauterized. Then you cut the spinopalin artery. Then you remove the posterior wall of maxillary sinus. What do you see next? It's a pterygopalatine fossa. So that is the posterior wall of maxillary sinus being removed. This actually is a pterygopalatine fossa. And we are lateralizing the contents of the pterygopalatine fossa to expose what is called the pterygoid base. So that is a pterygoid base. This is the Vidian nerve. This is the Vidian nerve here. This is the foramen rotundum and the V2. This is the V2. There is again some more removal of the spinoid floor. There is the tumor in the spinoid sinus. And this is the median nerve. It's the median nerve. This is a, uh, it's called the pilot of vaginal canal. This is the median nerve. We drill around the median nerve. The median nerve is a very important landmark in endoscopic uh, skull base surgery. Once you trace the median nerve, it will take you to posterior to the foramen lacerum. So now for us, this median nerve is an important landmark to identify the foramen lacerum. So you drill around the median nerve, drill around and you get into the foramen lacerum. That is an important landmark for us. So we liquid the foramen, foramen lacerum somewhere there. This is the right side internal carotid artery. And now we are drilling, uh, we are located the foramen lacerum there. Now we are drilling the, now we are drilling uh, the wall of the cavernous sinus here. So we have the yellow here, the optic strut here. So from the optic strut to maxillary strut, the, wall, the bone is removed. The entire bone overlying the cavernous sinus is removed now. And that is a micro doppler being used to locate the carotid artery. And now we are going to open the door of the uh, lateral compartment of cavernous. This is a, that's the anterior wall of cavernous sinus. We are opening right into the uh, lateral compartment. We have the carotid artery here. The carotid artery, we are opening the dura of the lateral compartment.
and we are now using the curet to remove the tumor. So this to orient you again, this is the carotid artery, the carotid artery, this one here, and this is a tumor. We are not actually targeting a complete tumor removal because the, the tumor has infiltrated around the cranial nerve. So if you remove, if you want to attempt a complete tumor removal, you'd be affecting, you'd be cutting off all the cranial nerve. So we just need to debulk the tumor here. And that's an adequate debridement. You are seeing the carotid artery very clearly now. <coughs> and that is some CSF leak. And so uh, that is end of the deviant, end of the surgery here. And we just need to plug some, put some fat and put a Haddad flap and to close that region. So that was the lateral compartment. So only compartment left behind now is the inferior compartment. And so I would probably share this case. This actually is an orbital apex. This uh, lesion, this 30-year-old uh, uh, boy, he had a uh, three, four, six cranial palsies on the right side. Uh, he wasn't responding to steroids. And that is probably when we decided that we'd operate upon this case. So we are going to, the MRS suggestions of pathology in the cavernous and it's mainly in the inferior compartment. So this is that case, is the right side. Again, the maxillary sinus is open here. And that's a spinopalin artery being located. So the spinopalin artery. You cauterize that, you find you drill, find the pterygoid base, drill, drill the pterygoid base, and now we are here at the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. This is the anterior wall of cavernous sinus. The inferior compartment is right here. And that we are opening the door of the inferior compartment. And that is, we yeah, entered the inferior, com inferior compartment. And that actually is, in, the pack is into the, placed in the inferior compartment. Some more biopsy is being taken now. We don't find actually find a pathology. So we are just taking the, the dura for the biopsy. And that actually is a horizontal cavernous carotid artery. It's a horizontal cavernous carotid artery. And this is the inferior compartment. So the carry home message, the cranial nerve injury can occur while, while, while working in the lateral compartment or, or at times in the inferior compartment. And it can also occur if you overpack the posterior compartment. However, fortunately, the most common space involved is a superior space. And this compartment is the most easiest to approach also. And you don't have a cranial nerve, cranial nerve which runs in the superior compartment. And I would like, uh, I presented this because, because uh, most of the surgeons are even scared to operate on the superior compartment. I want more surgeons to venture to superior compartment. So that's my carry home message. Thank you. Okay, very good, Bernard. Okay, uh, we have some extra people that came and probably some ENT people here. Okay, any comments or questions for anyone in the audience? Just unmute yourself. And uh, if you haven't met Bernard, just introduce yourself. So Neil, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely here. Oh, I'm okay. The presentation. 
any comments or questions for Vernard? Uh, well, I found like uh, the presentation was really very good uh, while explaining the anatomy mainly. But like uh, the surgical video, like I could not follow because the network is really problematic here. Okay. It's like uh, moving a very slow motions. But like, uh, as you mentioned, like you use the uh, flap, like a nasoceptal flap for uh, preventing the complications like rhinorrhea, like a nasal yeah. and like a CSF leak, leakage mainly. Yeah, I, I I have encounter not encounter I can say like I have seen uh, many cases uh, regarding this pituitary adenoma like they do the nasal flap in in the working university right now, so almost I think uh, before like I was uh, thinking like a nasal flap is is just a <clears throat> uh, like a no of use. But now, like I, I, I came to understand, like it is needed uh, to prevent the CSF leakage as a post-operative complications. But like, uh, I, I want to ask one more question. Like, if you were uh, doing the nasal flap, like to prevent the CSF leakage, like how long does it take to recover the nasal flap? I mean, like, is there any other complications regarding the uh, this medial aspect of the nasal septum? Yeah. Uh, once you take the nasal flap, you're going definitely going to get more crusting and it is going to take at least three to six months for the crusting to go up and the nasal cavity to be normal. So you need to ask the patient to use a lot of saran douches and go to the ENT OPD uh, once in two weeks to, to do, do the cleaning. And it takes at least at least three months to for the nasal cavity to clear by itself. And uh, we don't need to, it's not required that we take the nasal flap in all cases. So um, you, if you take the flap initially, if you expect yeah. the CSF leak, but if you don't have a CSF leak, you can put the flap back to the septum. Understand, you can take the flap, keep it as a, what do you call, uh, standby. And if you don't have the leak, you can put it back to the septum and switch it. So you mean like uh, it takes like a three to six months to recover the nasal septal flap again? Yeah, you you got it right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Okay. Very good. Comments or questions from the other panelists? Biswarajan, Ashila, Grish, Mark Kenanon, Dr. Waleska. Any comments or? We'd like to meet you guys. Can you hear us? Uh, she's just a dark space in the Netherlands. Okay. Okay. I guess if there's no more comments or questions, thank you very much, Vinod, for another great presentation. Uh, you've done a few with us before, right? Yeah. <laughs> Four or five. Okay, okay, we're gonna adjourn this, Vinod, and uh, yeah. edit it, and we'll send you a copy. And we'll start. Sure, we're gonna have another talk with Jason at, at yeah. approximately 45 minutes.